Hello, and welcome to Chase Plastics, Chase the Knowledge webinar on understanding UL requirements for plastics. My name is Sherry Cudd, and I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for Chase Plastics. Thank you all for your interest in this webinar and for taking time out of your day to learn about UL requirements as they pertain to plastics. A few quick housekeeping items before we begin today. Everyone except the presenter is on mute and will be for the duration of the webinar, but if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so at any time by typing it in the questions section of your toolbar. If you'd rather ask your question verbally, please raise your hand uh, in your toolbar and I will unmute you and call on you to ask your question out loud. In addition to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick, who I'll introduce here in just a moment, we also have Andy Conti, Technical Development Engineer, on hand to answer your questions today. If your question does not get answered right away, please uh, be patient. We will address it at the end of the webinar. You can access and download PDF copies of the presentation Andrea is going to show today, our product line card, and information on our technical engineering team in the handout section during the presentation. The presentation will not be emailed, so if you'd like a copy, please download it from the handout section before the webinar concludes. A certificate of completion and a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you about an hour after the webinar concludes. We would greatly appreciate it if you could complete the survey at the end of the webinar so that we can improve on future ones for you and cover the topics that interest you most. We encourage you to check out past webinars and recordings on the webinars page of our website under resources. While our next webinar is not yet scheduled, once it is, the registration details will be listed on this page and on our social media site. Also, if you would like a custom Chase the Knowledge presentation given to your organization discussing a specific topic or product, please send an email to your presenter, Andrea Kendrick. Our entire technical team is on hand to assist with technical issues, product selection, and educating you and your team on products and processes specific to your needs. Another great technical resource is the Chase to Knowledge blog on our website. There are currently three topics live, and they can be found at chaseplastics.com slash blogs. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick. Andrea is a technical development engineer with Chase Plastics, and she's been with us for six years. She received her bachelor's degree in plastics engineering technology from Ferris State University. For those of you who have attended Chase the Knowledge webinars in the past, or contacted our technical engineering team for assistance, you're very familiar with Andrea and the level of expertise she brings to the table. So without further ado, Andrea. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope all is well. We'll go ahead and get started talking about understanding UL requirements for plastics. So our agenda for today, so we're gonna go over what is UL, so you hear the term, what does it mean? We're gonna talk about some of the common tests and requirements for plastic materials. Then we're gonna go over a little bit more specific and a little more deeper into some of those specific tests. So we're gonna talk about 94 flame rating. We're gonna talk about UL 746 A, B, and C, uh, a little more in depth and a couple of the tests that are under those headers as well. Talk about some considerations. And then finally, we're gonna end by talking about where do I find a yellow card, which is essentially your certification that has all of this testing for the materials that have been approved under those tests um, and have certain ratings. So what is UL? UL is Underwriters Laboratory Inc. Uh, it's an independent product safety certification organization that was established in 19, or excuse me, 1894. Uh, so you'll see the kind of UL, they, they also have UL Prospector, UL IQ for looking stuff up. So large organization. Essentially they develop standards and test procedures for products, materials, anywhere from plastics, uh, colorants, other uh, types of materials as well, um, to really deal with product safety, it's their main concern. So the common tests that we're gonna talk about a little bit, I kind of mentioned, so we're gonna talk about UL94, so it's the flammability of plastic materials for parts and devices and applications. So we're gonna talk about that, the different ratings, 
how you how you get those ratings. And we're talking about the 746A. We're talking it's your short-term property evaluation, so short-term tests. We'll talk about some of those. We'll talk about 746B, which is your long-term evaluation test, and then we'll talk about 746C, uh, which is for use in electrical uh, equipment evaluations. So starting with our 94 uh, for flame. So 94, UL94 addresses the flammability of the material itself. So there's a, a handful of different ratings under this test. You've got your HBs, which are going to be your horizontal burns. You're going to have your vertical burns, so your V0, V1, and V2. And then you have your 5 Vs, so your 5 VA and 5 VB. So essentially your 94 flame rating, and, and if you guys have seen my data sheet webinar this is a familiar page um, so your flame and burn test is conducted on these materials the conditions are extended to compare relative burn characteristics of different materials uh, to kind of compare and see how they're going to perform in use uh, so in, in application what does that kind of mean what, the, what does it look like if you're not familiar with those ratings at all so hb stands for horizontal burn it's the least stringent of those tests then you have your vertical burns which is your v0 v1 and v2 uh, we went very clever on the naming here. Uh, and so different requirements are used or needed for different applications. And so V2 at a minimum is generally used for unattended portable equipment. And then you have your 5VA and 5VB. They're conducted on plaques, most stringent test. Uh, and then your 5VA is typically what's used at a minimum for unattended permanent mount equipment. So I do want to take a second to mention that when we're talking about these ratings and these tests, we do want to make sure that we're understanding if there's going to be a requirement for these ahead of time. So again, also, if you guys happen to catch the material selection presentation that I gave, we talk about understanding the requirements ahead of time because it makes material selection a lot easier. So if we get through the process of designing a part, maybe you got tooling or start running some material and then you go, ah, well, just kidding, I actually need flame rating for this particular part. It becomes difficult because now we have to go back and try to find you a material that is going to meet that because a lot of these requirements and a lot of these flame ratings, depending on the base material you're utilizing, does require the material to have additional flame packages in them. And so it's something that we want to make sure we're aware of ahead of time and we're making sure we're working with the end user to understand those requirements as we move forward with selecting materials. So I just wanted to put that out there as we start going through some of these tests. So what does that look like as an actual picture? So your horizontal burn will be your specimen is laid horizontally, and then we light the end. Your vertical burns are just that. They're stood upright, vertical, and they light at the bottom. And then your plaque over on the right-hand side is gonna be what you do for the 5VA and 5VB burn tests. So that's what that looks like visually if you're trying to picture how we're doing the testing. So quick little guide, I'm not gonna go through it super deep um, and in detail, but it is a good guide to kind of help you understand the difference between the ratings, specifically your vertical ratings and your 5VA and 5VB because they are a little bit different. So your HB rating um, is the only one where you have to test three different samples. The rest all require five. Um, and then you have a square plaque for your 5VA and 5VB like in the picture. And then the other ones are more of your standard, just the rectangular uh, uh, bar that you're testing. Um, and so the biggest difference are going to be between your vertical burns. And so it's going to be how long the flame is allowed to continue on. So your V2s and your V1s are 30 seconds, whereas your V0 is the max time is 10 seconds. So you can see there's a, a, a jump in performance once you get to V0. Um, and then the other portion would be um, they do have the cotton underneath it. So when they light it, is it allowed to ignite that cotton underneath it or not? And so the only one where you can ignite it is going to be a V2. Once you get to V1 and V0, they cannot. And then um, the other thing that we want to note is we will sometimes, a customer will understand or, or will know that it needs to be a flame rated material, which is great, but generally it's it's not enough. We, we can assume or we generally tend to assume when someone says they want a flame rated material that we're looking at a V0 material. But if we can understand what flame rating we need, that helps a lot. And the other thing to keep in mind too is these are done at different thicknesses. So depending on the wall thickness of your part that you're designing or molding or you know what have you, we want to understand what the thickness of that is. So we make sure we match that with the uh, call out that you need, the flame rating that you need. So if your part's one and a half millimeter and the rating's at three millimeter, it doesn't do anyone any good because at the thinner section it's going to burn easier. So it's not it's unlikely to have the same rating so again just another one of those things to keep in mind we want to make sure we're aware of 
that we're designing it for the part and have that. So this is just a little table that kind of goes over some of the different requirements for the different types. So your portable tended household equipment, all other portable equipment, and then all other equipment that is not portable or portable tended. Uh, so this kind of just gives you a little snap of, hey, this is what's needed. So you see HB for portable tended is pretty common. Any other portable ones, it's not gonna be attended, more of your V2 rating and then up, and then all other equipment, permanent mounts type stuff that's not attended, 5VA type requirement. So we're gonna talk about a little one, just a little bit more in detail, uh, just to give a little bit more to kind of explain the different ones. So your horizontal burn, HB, so this is another picture, but this one kind of gives you the full setup where it's it's clamped at the end and then it's burning from the right-hand side. So this is something that we would say it's the least stringent of them, like we mentioned. It's not typically permitted where flammability requirement is an actual safety requirement. So where you have a requirement for flammability, it's not gonna be something that will allow HB materials to be used in. Uh, with, with the exception, perhaps the part is really just used for mechanical or decorative purposes. Outside of that, we have to start looking at materials that are gonna have better flame rating uh, that are gonna extinguish the flame a little bit better. Next we have your vertical burns, your V0s, V1s, V2s. They are more demanding than HB. Uh, typically, we mentioned V2 is the minimum required for portable unattended equipment. So again, it's a more stringent test. So as you start requiring more and more of the material, we have to start looking at potentially adding stuff, more and more packages or additives to the material to get make sure that it's passing that. So again, something we want to know ahead of time that we're addressing. And then your 5VA. So these ones are approximately five times more stringent than your vertical burn test. It's a very stringent test. I mean, you can imagine it's a test plaque and you put the flame just directly underneath it. And so the biggest difference between your 5VA and your 5VB when you look at it, your 5VA does not allow burn through. So you cannot have the flame burn through the plaque, whereas your 5VB does allow burn through. So the easy way to remember that is B allows burn through. Um, and so it's the most stringent. It is typically specified when you have fire enclosures in larger office machines, uh, and then also a minimum for unattended permanent mount equipment. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're meeting that requirement if, if it's something that's needed. So now we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the UL 746A. So this is going to be your short-term property evaluations. So we're going to go over some of these tests. So I do want to state ahead of time, I'm not going to spend the entire time reading the slide to you guys, but this will be here as a reference. So as Sherry mentioned, make sure you download it. It's a great reference tool for when you need to look up these tests because you're being asked for it. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is a lot of these tests that you'll see on a yellow card uh, for these short-term evaluation ones, they are rated and the units are given are, they're called performance level categories, PLCs. And so instead of having all these different units and measurements all over the yellow card, they simply give it a zero through seven or a zero through five, zero through four PLC rating, because uh, it just makes it easier. But in here, and like I mentioned, because it'll be a good reference, I do have it listed out kind of what that looks like as far as what are the values and what does each PLC, uh, how does it rate? So you can go back and reference that when you need to. So essentially your arc resistance is the number of seconds that a material resists the formation of surface conducting path. And so the rating is done in seconds, so you can see PLCs, the lower the number, the better it performs. So in this case, the time for arc resistance, if it's greater 420 or greater, you get a PLC of zero, and then down the line, all the way down to, if it only lasts up to 60 seconds, it gets a rating of seven. So when you're comparing materials and you're looking at separate yellow cards, the lower numbers are always gonna perform better. The other thing to also keep in mind is at different thicknesses, you could have different uh, values as well. So another thing to keep in mind. So if you're looking at your parts 1.5 millimeter thick, you want to make sure you're looking at the 1.5 millimeter if it has a uh, rating at that thickness. So you don't want to look at a, a larger thickness or what have you. Want to match it up to what you're doing. CTI, your comparative tracking index. Again, like I mentioned, PLC values. This is the voltage which causes tracking, uh, also known as electrical breakdown on the surface. Um, and so again, your volts 600 or greater gives you a zero, and then down the line, all the way down to under 100, uh, gives you a five. So again, lower lower number, better performance. HAI, high amp arc ignition, also on a PLC scale, zero to four. It simulates the situation in which arc occurs between two electrodes under low voltage, but high current. 
So this will be given in the number of arcs it takes to cause the ignition. So your zero is 120 or greater, you get a PLC of zero, all the way down to if it takes 15 or less, you get a four. And we talk about high voltage arc tracking rate, also a PLC rating of zero to four. It's to determine the ability to withstand repeated high voltage, low current arcing on the surface without creating a conductive path. This one is done in millimeters per minute. So this is the tracking rate. So if you're zero through 10, you get a zero, all the way up to 150 or greater gives you a four. So again, just good tables here, great place to reference some more information if you need to come back and look at it because you're being asked for it and you'd like some more information on it. HWI, also done on a zero to five. This is the ease of ignition when the material's in contact with a heat source that's not, uh, not an open flame. So this is done in how many seconds it takes before it ignites. So if it takes longer than two minutes, 120 seconds or greater, you get a zero. If it takes less than seven seconds to ignite, you get a PLC of five. So lower number, better performance. So some other short-term property evaluations that I had, I had added in here, your dielectric strength, we get asked about that. It's the voltage per unit thickness at which a material will conduct electricity. The higher the value, the more electrically insulating the material is. So this is one of the ones that is not given in a PLC rating. It gives the actual volts per mil or kilovolts per millimeter. So that's, you just, you need to know what units you're looking at. And so those values are given that way. And then dielectric constant uh, information's in here. I won't spend too much time on it, uh, but I did want to have this in here for reference for you guys. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the 746B. So this is gonna be your long-term uh, property performance. So we just talked about short-term, now we're talking about a little bit more long-term performance. So again, if you happen to catch the data sheet presentation, this slide looks fairly familiar. So this is going to be um, your RTI, so relative thermal index. This is, um, you see pretty commonly, it's given in degrees Celsius. It's basically the material's ability to retain a certain amount of their properties, so 50%, when exposed to elevated temperatures for an extended period of time is the shorthand version of kind of what this is. So basically, material based on their chemical structure also can be given a generic thermal index. We'll talk about that, the different values. But the whole gist of it is at what temperature after 100,000 hours, which is equates to about 11.4 years, is the material gonna maintain at least 50% of its original value for electrical, mechanical, and strength uh, properties. So whatever the number is, just know that it's an extended time, 100,000 hours, that it maintained at least 50% of its properties. So what happens is if you're looking at yellow cards and you're kind of seeing a swing, some polycarbonates are you know, up in the 100 range, some are in the 80s. Sometimes what happens is you can be given a generic value based on the material itself. So these are actually, this is a table of what the generic value would be if it, if the manufacturer doesn't have their uh, grade tested, their material tested, this would be the generic value that it would be given. So if you're looking for something that has what you would consider elevated RTIs because it had actually been tested, you would have to find one that the manufacturer paid to have that grade tested and, and receive those values. So just as a quick run through, your polyamides are going to be given a generic of 65, your ABSs are 60, some of your higher end materials like your peaks are going to be in the 130 range or PPS in the 130 range. Uh, PEIs in the 105 range, so real good generic uh, values. And then ones that aren't listed on here, the majority of the other ones are given a value of about 50 C. So just good information to have. And that way also, you know, when you're looking at them and you're comparing two different materials, if you're like, man, this one's really outperforming the other, it could just be that it was given the generic value and wasn't actually tested. So now we're talking a little bit about the um, 746C. So this is for use in electrical equipment. So the big ones here are gonna be if you hear someone ask you for outdoor suitability, uh, which is more commonly someone will ask you for an F1 or an F2 rating. That's what you'll see most commonly. So what does that look like? So material that is considered suitable for outdoor use has gone through ultraviolet testing and or water exposure and immersion testing. The material must exhibit 70% retention across its flammability mechanical impact and mechanical strength to get the F1 or F2 rating. So unlike RTI, where they did 100,000 hours and it had to maintain 50% of its properties, 
this has to maintain 70%. So it does have to maintain a little bit better property performance across that testing. So for UV exposure, your ultraviolet light exposure, you're looking at 720 hours of twin in enclosed carbon or 100, or excuse me, 1,000 hours of Xenac ARC weatherometer conditioning. So this would be your UV testing. So they run it through here uh, for those hours, depending on what uh, unit they're using to get the UV testing. And then your water exposure immersion is for seven days at 70 C. So that's the testing that's done there. So the thing to keep in mind too is, is F1 is, uh, it's not a bad value to look at. Just know that it's not really for a, an extended period of time. I and mean, you're looking at a thousand hours. So if you have something that's gonna be outside for a very long time, it's something that you're gonna wanna make sure, sure, if it passes F1, that's cool, but also make sure that it's got substantial UV in it as well so that it's going to perform the way you need it to so f1 is is okay but again it's just it's only a thousand hours so if you have something where you have the expectation that it's going to you know last for years and years thousand hours isn't necessarily correlating to that for you so what did the two different values mean so f1 itself means that it has passed both the uv and the water exposure so easy enough we expose it to uv we immersed it in the water for seven days. It passed both, no problem, F1 all day, easiest one. F2 indicates that it's only met or has been partially tested for UV or water exposure immersion, meaning it's either passed one and failed another or passed one and has only partially been test for, tested for the other. The difficult part is the yellow card doesn't distinguish which one it is. So it could be that you're looking at an ABS material that doesn't have to, and maybe it didn't pass the UV, but it passed the water, or it passed the UV and it didn't pass the water. So the problem being the F2 doesn't really tell you which one it is, so it's difficult to tell. So a lot of times when you're looking at the suitability, generally we just shoot for F1 because then we know for a fact it passed both and we don't have a problem trying to distinguish which one we needed and which one that one did or didn't pass. So now some modification comments. So these are pulled from the 746D. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but essentially it states the first one is that if you're gonna add stuff to it, if you're gonna add colorants, flame retardants, mold release, anything like that, we wanna make sure that it doesn't have a negative effect on the critical properties of that material. So we won't wanna just be adding things to something that we're gonna use in a UL type product uh, that meets certain requirements and then start throwing a bunch of stuff into it and then have that ruin its properties or its performance. And then the other one is that uh, we talk about regrind. It should not contain more than 25% regrind by weight that's been dry blended back in. So if you've worked with other techs uh, or maybe even your sellers and you've asked the question, hey, I kind of want to use regrind uh, with my parts and blend it into my prime uh, version material. A lot of times you'll hear us say a good rule of thumb is 25% or less. And this is kind of why, because it's an established value that UL uses at 25%. So we tend to kind of follow in line with that a little bit. Um, but then side note is really more, you know, if it's gonna perform the way you need it to, you can use as much as you want outside of the UL requirement because 25% or less. So just something to keep in mind if you're starting to, if you're using 30, 35%, well now you're kind of outside of what UL says is okay. So just keep that in mind. So there are a few exceptions uh, to these rules. Uh, and so what, what do those look like? So mold release is okay to be used for HB uh, rated materials. V2 or better, you have to, you're gonna have to test it. So if you're using a, a substantial amount of mold release, you're gonna have to test it if the material is V2 or better and it, cause it could potentially cause problems or issues with the properties. Blowing agents, so chemical blowing agents for sink mark reduction is okay uh, without additional testing if you're moving the density reduction by less than 5%. So if you're just sprinkling in a little bit to get some reduction, it's okay. You can water dye the outer surface of parts utilizing materials that are HB rated or V2 rated if it's a polyamide. Outside of that, if you're looking at materials that are V2 that aren't polyamide or if you're looking at you know, V0 or what have you, testing is going to have to be done. Colorants, concentrates, and dyes that are HB or better can be blended into HB rated materials without extra testing. So as long as you're, you're good and it's going to pass HB, you could put it in your HB polycarbonate, ABS, whichever grade you're using, and it will not be a problem. 
The problem comes in where you have to start using colorants for materials that are full, full blown flame rated, your V0s, your 5 VAs. So what happens with that is you need to utilize a colorant that has been not only approved to maintain that rating, so whatever rating you need, the V0, 5 VA, what have you, but it also needs to be approved to be used in that very specific base resin. So that's where it becomes a little more complicated. So standard base materials are just rated based on that material. So you're looking at whatever graded material you're going to use. You see if it's got a yellow card for flame rating, good to go. Now you say, well, that's cool. I like this FRABS that I'm using, but I kind of want it in white. I think it'd look really cool if it was white. So now we have to look at utilizing a colorant, if we're going to do it, a colorant that has been approved to maintain V0, that's the rating you're looking at, but also approved for that specific FRABS grade. So we got to make sure that we're matching that up. We can't just pick a V0 rated colorant if it hasn't been approved for use in that very specific base. That's where, again, it gets a little complicated. So if you have any questions, please reach out to someone like myself, tech person. We can kind of help walk you through that. But I do want to make everybody aware that's kind of how that needs to be done. And then the last one, flame retardant concentrate can be dry blended into grade specific resin at greater than um, or at the minimum letdown ratio to obtain that flame rating. So you can add it in to make sure you're getting to that flame rating. So those are kind of the exceptions to the rules of don't add stuff or it's going to be a problem or you're going to have to do more testing essentially. So yellow card lookup. So we do have a lot of times when we're looking at uh, data sheets or stuff like that, you'll see it's got the ratings, it's got your RTIs, your flame ratings on the data sheet, which is great. That's that's fine and dandy. We really want to make sure that we're utilizing the ULIQ website or working with someone like Chase Plastics that can look it up for you. Um, to pull an actual yellow card from UL's website. So this is where they keep all of the certifications for the materials that have been approved and tested for whatever you know test you're looking for, whether it be your, your flame readings, your RTIs, your CTIs, what have you. Um, this is where they store, it's basically their database of what's been approved. So this is where you wanna go. The other thing that I do like to point out is UL Prospector is great as well for information. There are occasionally some um, step, some missed uh, communication between them. So when all, I would, I shouldn't say all SVLs, the absolute best place to go ever, you just come to you like you. I did include the link. So if you guys download it, if you've never been there before, there's a link to get to it. Best place to look stuff up. You can sort by trade names. You can sort by uh, manufacturers. You can sort by material types. If you know you need a, you know, a nylon V0, you can look it up that way. You can look it up by what property test you're looking at. So I need the V0. You can also start to filter by the thickness. So I need you know, V0 at 1.5 or V0 at 0.7. So you can look it up that way. The other way you can look it up as well. And the other thing I did want to point out, because we talked about color in a little bit, is that your materials can have what's known as an all color listing or just a sp color specific listing. So if it has an all color listing, so if you actually look in here, let me see if I can pull a pointer up for us. So if you look here where it says all color listing here, what that means is the manufacturer can produce that material in any color, uh, as long as you know their standard MOQ, all that jazz for the commercial side of it, but they can produce it in any color and have it maintain those ratings. So if you come and you're like, hey, I need polycarbonate, but I want it to be red in V0, we would have to look and we would make sure that we had something that was all color listed. So we knew the manufacturer could produce that particular resin in that color. Um, some of them do not have that. So actually same, if you're looking at the same page, you see where it says NC right here. This is not an all color listing. This NC means that it's for natural color. And so that particular grade of material is really only allowed uh, to have that rating in natural. So just keep that in mind, you're looking at stuff. If you're looking at maybe it's a black versus a natural, we wanna make sure that the listing is there correctly for all color or not all color. We just wanna make sure we're checking that out. The other thing I did wanna mention as well is that your uh, short-term property testing, your HWIs, HAIs, CTIs, you can kind of see in the snap as well that they're also done at thickness. So you wanna make sure that we're matching the correct thickness as well when we're doing that. So if I need a, CTI of two at 1.5, I need to make sure I'm getting it at 1.5 and not looking at the value for three or 
you know, what, what other value. The other thing I did want to mention as well is we went over a good handful of kind of the bigger tests, the majority of the tests, but there are other tests that are on a yellow card as well that I didn't mention. So if you get into the point where you're looking at a, a program or you're working on something where it has an additional test, maybe Glowwire. I didn't, I didn't mention Glowwire, but Glowwire is, is another big one um, where you need that information or ball pressure is also one. Um, and you're not, you know, you didn't see it in this presentation, but you maybe want some more information on it because you have a project that needs it. Feel free to reach out and we can talk about it more specifically. I just wanted to make sure we covered kind of the main meat and potatoes of a yellow card and the ones that we ask for most, re most commonly. Okay, and so this is actually, if you've seen the new website or used the new UL IQ website, they actually have it listed a little bit different. This is what they call the classic yellow card looks like, and it's called a yellow card because it's yellow. So this is what the classic one looks like. It has everything kind of listed out. So what you're looking at is you've got some all color listings. You've got your all color listings here at 0.4. You've got your naturals at 0.7, all color listings again, your flame class at those thicknesses. You have an all color listing for V2 at 0.4, and then it goes up to an all color listing at V0 at 1.5. So that's something you'll see pretty commonly as well. The thinner sections might have a lower flame class rating, and then you get to the thicker sections, you get the higher flame class. And then you'll notice your RTIs, again, also done by based on the thickness. So 105s up to 170s. And then your other testing is here, CTIs, dielectric strength. Uh, so a couple other tests here as well. So if it's something where, you're looking for something very specifically, you need to meet certain things, uh, you can find a nice yellow card that has that information on it to really compare uh, and find a good option. So with that, uh, that's kind of what I had for you guys um, going over the yellow cards and the different testing. So with that, I will say, I'll kind of turn it back to Sherry a little bit and then we'll kind of maybe get into some questions if you guys had some. All right. Thank you, Andrea, for your comp uh, your comprehensive presentation, as always. At this time, if you have any questions, please type them in the question section, uh, like I said, or raise your hand, and I will unmute your microphone if you'd like to uh, vocalize your question if it's too long to type. We have Andy Conti, technical development engineer who has been with Chase Plastics for 18 years, on hand to assist Andrea with our questions today. Uh, but once again, if you'd like to download the handouts, now is the time to do so before the webinar ends. The handout, Andrea's presentation, will not be uh, emailed to you. The, the uh, recording will be, and the recording will be available on our website. Uh, as a reminder, as you type your questions, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. Your responses will help shape future Chase the Knowledge webinars, and we welcome your feedback. Also, please be sure to check out our new blog page at chaseplastics.com slash blogs and past webinar recordings and future webinar announcements at chaseplastics.com slash webinars. If you'd like to have a custom Chase the Knowledge topic presented to your organization, please reach out to Andrea Kendrick and her information can be seen there on the screen. Uh, so we'll turn it over for questions. Like I said, you can raise your hand or type your question in. Okay, Brian Hirschman asked a question. When asking colorant to an all colors resin, does the colorant need to have a UL rating on them? That answer is yes. Um, the all colors listing basically refers to anything that leaves the manufacturer's location. So if you're ordering something from the manufacturer, the manufacturer is pre-coloring it. Um, then that's when the all colors apply. Um, in a sense, if you want to add an additive to it uh, to to achieve uh, uh, to or, or if you have a, a colorant, let, let's say you have a uh, a colorant that you want to add to an already FR material, that ha that colorant has to be pre-tested by the colorant manufacturer or UL afterwards um, to make sure that it is not affecting the color. So. Hopefully that uh, that clarifies that for you. And I will say, Andy, just an additional comment that I was just thinking about, because as I was explaining earlier, they do give you also um, a dosage information. 
So on the yellow card specific, there are actual, the yellow cards exist for the colorants as well. So that way you can tell what they've been approved in. They give you um, what rating they can meet because some materials are uh, listed for 5VA, but the colorants can't maintain that. They can only help maintain V0. So you want to make sure you're checking and matching up to what you need. Um, and then also it gives you a letdown ratio to make sure that you're adhering to because if you go outside that, you're no longer following what it's been approved to. And it could also be a problem. Um, Del Doty asked here, for mechanical components, uh, do most device manufacturers use RTI for impact or RTI-S? I think there you might have meant M for mechanical as the basis for their approval. Um, I think they'd probably usually be looking, I guess it depends on the situation. UL is the ultimate arbiter here. Uh, certainly if the material is going to be in a impact sensitive. Uh, I usually find the impact sensitive is uh, the thing that you, you'll usually see first. But again, I guess uh, the device manufacturers really need to have that discussion first uh, with UL because UL is going to lay out the requirements. Um, Mark Smith asks, would every plastic pass an HB test? I hear people joke that even paper would pass. And if so, why do they ever need to go tested and approved? Um, in my experience, in my experience, I have not uh, found materials. Well, I shouldn't say I have not found materials that won't pass HB. Uh, I've, I've usually found materials, uh, solid materials will always pass, it seems, in F, FMVSS. That's a, uh, a less restrictive test. Uh, but no, HB is not an automatic listing. So you can't just say, oh, it wasn't tested, oh, it'll meet HB. Uh, odds are it probably will, but uh, it's, you, you, you can't uh, assume it there because certainly if UL tests it later and they say, hey, it, it didn't meet it, um, you'd be in a world of hurt. If parts have to, okay, um, if parts have two layers uh, molded parts, an inner layer and an outer layer, how would you uh, look at the RTI? Only on the outer layer? Um, that's a good question. And in all honesty, I've never run into that. I'd, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to check with UL, or, or again, you'd have to uh, consult with UL on that. I, I, I don't know the answer on that. Okay, if we have any other questions, I'm sorry, Andrea, go ahead. I was just saying, I would have to imagine, I mean, the idea there is that it could be exposed to temperatures around that. So if the whole component that you're making is being exposed to a certain temperature, I would have to imagine that all portions of it are gonna have to meet the RTI that is, is, is being set out, would be my guess. I also have not ran into it, but if I had to take a guess, that would be what I would assume. Candy, it looks like you've got a question here from Brant. On the IQUL page under the color column, sometimes there is an at symbol or a dollar sign. Yes, on that, you'll, you'll usually see underneath in the yellow card, it is referring to some combination. Andrea, maybe can you bring up uh, the last uh, slide there where you had a UL here? Oh, uh, one forward. The yellow card. Yeah, I mean, in these cases here, they have an X here which says all colors except natural. They, they can use any combination here that basically uh, is sort of a catch all, if you will. So, a lot of times, like I said, if you see that, uh, the at or the dollar sign, it there it, it will be clarified in this uh, in this lower section here, the note section. Uh, there with the specific. It, it, it's not automatic that, oh, an app means this or a dollar sign means that. Yeah, they have um, they have ways of making uh, combination yellow cards as well. You'll see some manufacturers will do where they want maybe like a glass filled product and they want anywhere from 10 to 40 glass to be covered. And so similar to this yellow card, when you see there's multiple grades, actually this is an Ultem one. So multiple grades of Ultem are included within this yellow card itself. Sometimes you'll see ones where it's got, you know, 10 to 40 glass is all within one yellow card because then they can keep it all under one listing. But anytime you see kind of like a specialty symbol or sign, 
they generally have, if you look either at the bottom or off to the side, it will tell you what that means. And so just look and make sure we're just kind of watching all of it. The other thing that you'll notice too, is if it has an F1 or F2 rating, it's given right after the um, grade. So right here, you can see this grade has an F2 rating. So that's what you'll see F1 or F2. Um, and sometimes actually, I do want to point out as well, I didn't mention, they sometimes will have two separate yellow cards for the same material, one for an F1 rated one, because maybe the flame rating for that particular one, they had to use it just a slightly thicker section because it didn't maintain the 70% retention once they did their F1 rating. And then one that will have uh, the flame rating without the F1 that performs a little bit better and has a little bit better flame rating. So we have seen that. We do have manufacturers where they'll have actually two yellow cards for the same, one if you need the F1, one if you don't. Okay. Alan, Andy, at, yes, yep, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Alan is asking, what is the effect of vacuum metalizing or sputter coating? Alan, um, I am assuming here that since those materials are going to act as flame retardants, they they probably would not affect it. Again, um, I'm trying to think of any any situation there. Um, UL again, we'll typically lay that out, but I would not expect those uh, to be making a material more flammable. All right, and we have a question here. Can you explain ball pressure versus impact test, cold impact test, any relation between those three tests? The Well, is I can't think of a numerical relation. Let, let me explain a little of the test. The ball pressure test is basically measuring uh, the indentation. They're, they're, they're trying to get a, a, an idea of the indentation on it. And again, this is usually more specific uh, to a part design. Uh, the, um, the impact test, I believe you're talking here of the RTI, uh, that's usually a notched IZOD test there. And again, it, it's sort of designed more for the long term, seeing how the impact properties uh, change. Uh, cold impact testing, I believe, is the is usually done uh, on a part, and usually there it's more a requirement. Like if you've got a part that has uh, electrical uh, circuitry inside it, uh, you know, UL may require you to say, well, we want you to uh, to drop this part from X height, uh, and then make sure that the part uh, a is still functional and B is, uh, well, no, I, I take that back. I don't know if it has to be functional, but it does have to be, uh, it, it, it can't break in such a manner that any live components uh, would be exposed there. Um, so I guess, like I said, they, they probably all would figure in, but uh, I would consider them all um, independent of each other in terms of testing. All right, and Mark is asking, what are typical costs to get UL recognition? Um, it depends how deep the testing is. For a simple HB, I think the current uh, cost is in the range of about, I think, 10, 10 grand, maybe 12 grand. Um, and that's a simple test. Um, like I said, the, uh, the tests there um, to get V0 or 5VA go up from there, it wouldn't surprise me if if they doubled. Uh, and then to get an RTI, this is really when it gets expensive. The reason for that is that RTI tests can't be conducted all at once. They basically have to be conducted over some period of time. Samples are oven aged at elevated temperatures, and then they're trying to correlate that with an Arrhenius relationship. But the whole point here is that since uh, a test like that could be six months, nine months, a year, uh, you could easily look at a hundred grand for that. It may even be higher. Yeah, we had um, one of our manufacturers is going through and getting RTI testing done and it's over a hundred grand and it's 24 months is what they've been told is the wait time for them getting it done. Wow, okay. Are there any lesser known UL tests for chemical and or solvent resistance? Here you're really very product and standard specific. For instance, I know that uh, there are standards uh, for things like uh, gas pumps, uh, you know, where, where they're saying, okay, you know, it'll have to resist uh, certain chemicals. 
Uh, but but here, I, I guess I would really advise that, you know, now you really are getting into, uh, a, again, something more specific to a product rather than a material. Um, again, uh, you know, it always makes a lot of sense in any kind of regulatory environment to have that discussion with you all up front. They will, they they will tell you, okay, for this product to be listed, you're going to have to uh, be listed to this standard, and then you go have to go into the standard. Okay, this question goes back to the ball pressure versus impact test. Maybe you've already answered this, but anything should focus on material selection for passing ball pressure in this case. Anything should focus on material selection. There's nothing in my experience I've I've come across on that. Andrea, I don't know, have you? No, I have not. And I I wouldn't I mean, we would obviously take the time to look it up and find that information, but off the top of my head I couldn't necessarily tell you, you know, which material is going to be looking to perform better versus another. Okay. Uh, the next question, sometimes there's a yellow card for American material and, and another one for Asian or Europe. What is the difference? They generally use the same grade designation for both. I don't really know because I think you're getting now into how UL um, coordinates between uh, their different locations. I, I do know that uh, manufacturers, uh, some manufacturers have uh, used the term uh, GG, uh, global grade, where they're basically trying to ensure that they are using uh, the same ingredients or ingredients that they've already pre-tested and know they're capable of. But here, if you're talking about uh, a yellow card for different areas, again, I'm, I'm not aware, like I said, specifically of uh, UL in Asia or Europe, although it, it wouldn't surprise me. But again, that that I think would be something uh, more with UL's internal working. And unfortunately, I don't know more about that. I think that they could potentially mean the different yellow cards for the different production sites for the material. Because we have, so like for example, LG has multiple yellow cards for the same material um, and the locations are different. So I'm wondering, it, Probably, I would have to imagine it correlates right. to where it's being produced. Yeah, that, that, that probably would make sense. That would make sense, yes. Okay, the next question is, any consideration for ESCR? Um, environmental stress crack resistance, um, I'm not aware of anything on the material side. Again, um, it is a well-known phenomenon, certainly, uh, going all the way back to uh, the 40s and polyethylene. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, if UL has run into problems, it'll probably be again in the product specific standard. Okay, and uh, Andrea, if you can flip back to your yellow card example, this one, this next question is for that. What does the X next to the material grade list in your yellow card example mean? Uh, is it different than the X in the color listing? Um, for this one, <clears throat> material designation may be followed by, a lot of times it has to do with um, like what suffix will follow it. So color codes and stuff like that. It's a good question. This one does have two separate X's in parentheses, so it does make it a little more difficult. Um, so this one, I would imagine, has more to do with the... I'm wondering almost... They both look identical. It wouldn't surprise me if maybe they did them at... Uh, maybe they might have gone uh, back or done something later um, at different times, like you know between when they did the V0 and when they did the hot wire ignition and high amp ignition, because all the other numbers across them look different there between the NC and the X. Mm -hmm. it... All right, and then we have a question here from Mark. Are there laws that require manufacturers to get UL listings, or do manufacturers elect themselves to get the listings for safety concerns and liability? 
I'm not aware of any uh, specific laws, although again, there are so many laws there um, that that it you know when when you're getting your your product, certainly when you're consulting uh, with your lawyer, uh, a, a good product lawyer would be good. However, in my experience, it's usually the idea that since UL is not a government agency, um, you know, it is uh, it is a, a an organization basically put together uh, so that you can use their testing uh, more or less as a marketing tool that your product has been tested and is safe. Uh, but from that aspect, you know, I'd, I'd say, um, like I said, because I, because I'm I'm just trying to think of any other situations. I mean, I know that certainly in medical situations there are government regulations, but again, in UL electrical products, I am not aware of any. All right, if there's any more questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the questions section. I think we have addressed all of the ones uh, that were there. I don't see any hands up. Um, so again, I'd like to thank Andrea and Andy for all of their expertise. Again, feel free to reach out to our technical engineers at any time with any technical questions, material uh, selection questions that you may have. And uh, because you did attend this webinar today, you will receive an invitation to our next webinar, which is not scheduled, but will be within the next uh, month or so. Uh, it can also be found on our website at chaseplastics.com slash webinars. Uh, you will receive a recording of this. If you would like a copy of the presentation, uh, please download that from the handout section because that will not be sent with a recording uh, that you'll receive in about an hour. So thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you on the next Chase the Knowledge webinar. Have a great day.